Hello, everyone. Mm -hmm. My name is Alham Puryamer. I'm independent curator and the curatorial team leader of Live Assembly, Recurrent Care, the program of Live Biennale this year. I live in Vancouver and I respectfully acknowledge that we live and work on the unceded and occupied ancestral and traditional lands of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territory mm -hmm. of the Masquerade, mm -hmm. Squamish, and Salawatid nations. Today's mm -hmm. program is relocating the center. Mm -hmm for tomorrow, strategic models. And in the morning, uh, I'm so uh, appreciate of participating Maria, Erit, and Dave. We have a conversation about models of possible actions covering the distance. Moderator of this um, panel uh, is uh, Dr. Sisi Fu. I'm gonna introduce Sisi. Uh, Dr. Sisi Fu, um, bachelor's from Harvard University two masters and doctor of philosophy uh, from Oxford University, is a political theorist and co-founder of the Political Arts Initiative, which invites 21st century political imaginations through digital technology and the creative and performing arts. Born in Hong Kong, she has studied, taught, organized, curated, and performed across cultural and educational institutions in Asia, Europe, the UK, and the Americas. Her research interests see that the nexus of politics, philosophy, and performance with the focus on contemporary manifestation of the political through individual and collective movement and expression. On the premise that the aesthetic reflects on uh, the ethical and the political, she draws from artistic practices for her forthcoming monograph on the politics of silence towards resuscitating silence as a positive political concept which can articulate and embrace the constructive ambiguities between attachment and detachment in political practices of speech and actions. From now on, Sissi is taking over. Thanks, Sissi, and thanks, everyone. Thank you, Alham. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to our speakers, to our audience. Thank you very much for being here. This is the final day of live assembly 2021, where we have been thinking about how repair and care could be concepts, techniques, and actually um, pretty viable propositions for the way that a live Biennale can move ahead, but also the way in which cultural institutions, and also to a certain extent, educational institutions can continue to move with the world to build perhaps uh, towards a vision uh, that uh, could sustain all of our myriad being. This is the final morning session of live assembly. Um, the day's theme is relocating the centers for tomorrow. And we're going to talk about strategic models and specifically models of possible actions this morning. Before we begin, um, just a very quick recap of what we have been talking about in day one and day two so that we could cover that distance um, and perhaps land somewhere um, towards at the end of today with some key mandates on how live uh, the Anali could move ahead, but also the ways in which we in our particular situatedness could make a difference in the world. So care and repair um, as we have discussed it in the past two days, require intentional reconsiderations of how time, space, and resources are valued and activated by, with, and for the people involved. This relational, embodied, less convention-based, and likely messier way of making, knowing, and being requires will and imagination, along with the commitment to stay with the trouble, as we discussed yesterday. Um, from the archive session um, in the middle of the day, um, we were nourished yesterday during Vancouver lunchtime um, through the art of cooking and eating together. We are getting at the idiosyncrasies of food that relate to taste and sensibilities that constitute collective gatherings, biennales or otherwise. And uh, yesterday afternoon, um, we had uh, the privilege of hearing about the ways that the power of the in-between afforded by experience of mixed heritage, migration, displacement, and translation, and facilitating those encounters and creating structures that allow for the polyphony of lived lives to perform and to resonate. 
So today we have three guests um, joining us from Europe um, and we're going to imagine and continue to enact a different and multiple centers of and for making, knowing and being that are equal to the urgencies of our times. What we are going to experience in the coming hour or so are three short presentations or propositions for us to consider together in the second part um, of the session today. So we are going to look at theories and practices of harnessing the not yet and the unknown and unknowable to create keener problems. We are going to inspect the relationship between forms and norms to activate artistic privilege strategically and to instituting otherwise to enable distributed and situated coalition formation. What we would have as usual per morning is a short break from around 10.45 to 11 o'clock uh, Pacific time, uh, a connection of breath and movement led by performance artist Margaret Dragu. On day one, we were activating our head and shoulders. Yesterday, we moved to our limbs and our extremities, um, which are perhaps the points of the most perceptible of movements. And today, Margaret and friends are going to get us to really live in and attend to our core and our spine, the centers of gravity that ground and enable movement. With that, we are going to start with Dave Beach's talk on some concerns with art's ethical turn. Dave Beach is an artist and writer. He is reader in art and Marxism in Chelsea, Camberwell and Wimbledon the University of Arts London. He is the author of Art and Labor and Art and Post-Capitalism, as well as Art and Value. Dave worked in the collective Free with Andy Hewitt and Mel Jordan between 2004 and 2018. His solo art practice revisits the critical traditions of photomontage and factography through the Marxist concept of uneven and combined development. With a reminder for Dave to unmute himself, Thank you. I hope that's um I hope everyone can see that. On the fourth of November twenty fifteen, I received an email that began with the statement that Gustav Metzger had called on arts professionals to make the shift from aesthetics to ethics to help redress the many environmental crises that we face. Arguably, the shift from aesthetics to ethics had already taken place as part of our social turn in the 1990s, but admittedly, this had often been understood by arts professionals as an expansion of aesthetics rather than a challenge to it, as Bourreau's idea of relational aesthetics clearly shows. And Claire Bishop's critique of Bourreau did not target his aesthetics, only the conviviality of his preferred social relations for art. Also, it has to be said, ethics was also more prominent in the alternative art sectors of community arts, performance, and certain communities around photography, video, and film. Mm -hmm. So the ethical turn might be the rest of art doing a catch up. Nevertheless, writing in the in the immediate. Sorry, I'm trying to no, just check and see if the slides were working. Nevertheless, writing in the immediate aftermath of the calls to boycott Manifesto 10, the Sydney Biennale and alongside campaigns against oil companies sponsoring art institutions. Metzger's argument that aesthetics ought to give way to ethics captures one of the leading tendencies of contemporary art at the time, especially for those types of art that had not had a strong history of ethical practice. Of course, aesthetic philosophy had from the outset assumed that art or experiencing art, which is a slightly different thing, had an ethical dimension. Art's ethical turn is more explicit than, than the assumption of, of ethics and aesthetics, and in certain respects appears to cancel the older ethics 
of art and aesthetics. Aesthetics originated as a discourse on the intrinsic ethical character of art and the appreciation of art. Ironically, therefore, the ethical turn in art is predicated on the separation of art and ethics. In both ethics and aesthetics, the literature has overstated the individual and understated the social, emphasizing character in both cases. Historically, the association of art and aesthetics with ethical conduct is based on the actual nobility of its historical patrons. While we are a long way from the courtly condition of art, this assumption of the nobility of art's public has not entirely been dissolved. Taste has been subjected to criticism for being a figure of social distinction, but ethics has not. The ethical turning out, therefore, can be read as a reinstating the social purpose of the aesthetic in the wake of the loss of sociological critique of art and the aesthetic. Character here is the mark of being fully human, which is fully or partially absent in bodies marked by race, gender, sexuality, class, and disability. Contemporary ethical practices uproot the enlightenment principles of ethics in favor of a partisanship that is embodied, institutional, structural, and so on. And the virtue of not being racist has been superseded by the need to admit one's lack of virtue to commit to the ongoing struggle against racism. The virtues of mastery are being undermined maybe by the virtues of the struggle against mastery. The contemporary condition of art is one in which the ethical dimension of aesthetics is associated with the dubious history of universal humanism, whereas the ethics of art appears to belong to a critical tradition of protest, reform, resistance and revolution. The art boycott, for instance, rejects the idea that art is inherently ethical in favour of the argument that art provides support for organisations and states, a support that must be withdrawn under objectionable circumstances. The art boycott combines qualities of the industrial strike with the techniques of ethical consumerism. Iris Marion Young was an early advocate of the political responsibility that was developed in the late 1990s, initially by students in the United States, that reimagined ethical consumption as a form of political activism. There is a profound link between the bourgeois revolution in taste and the rise of ethical consumerism. One of the ways in which the bourgeoisie converted the new theory of aesthetic judgments of taste into lived experience was through the display of taste and consumption. Not only did ordinary members of the new dominant class purchase scale down versions of the luxuries that had previously been collected by the aristocracy, they codified their homes as ethical consumers. Middle-class households were judged on their purchases and participated in the new regime of taste by judging the tastes of others. Jack Halberstam's Gaga feminism challenges taste and gender in a single project that might serve as a model for thinking about how art's ethical turn can also be a force for preserving and extending cultural elitism rather than challenging it. Since the 1990s, the judgment of consumer choices has added an economy of ethics to an economy of taste. Consumers do not merely purchase commodities that match their taste, but use their disposable income to make judgments on the ethical principles of companies producing goods and services. Boycotting companies with a bad ethical record is a technique not only to put pressure on companies to get their act straight, but is also a technique for charging consumer choice with ethical significance. Once commodities are judged in terms of their ethical charge, then consumers are judged in terms of their ethically charged consumer choices. Like the bourgeoisie of the 18th century, contemporary consumers cannot purchase use values without at the same time displaying something about themselves. And as with aesthetics, the ethics of the consumer confers a greater degree of agency to the wealthy than the poor. The unethical practices of the manufacturer stick to the consumer as if an ethical substance had been inserted into the commodity and was transferred to the consumer as part of the transaction that secured the good in the first place. Like taste, which appeared both as embodied in the commodity and belonging to the soul of the consumer, 
the ethics of retail responsibility is a stain that goes all the way down through every layer from the character of the consumer through the commodity and spreads into all that comes in contact with it. Unethical businesses sow seeds of sin that take root in the personality of the cursed consumer. The bourgeois encodification of commodities as markers of taste is the prototype of ethical consumerism. So art shift from aesthetics to ethics is best understood maybe as a revival of the aesthetic concealed within, within ethics. A return to aesthetics for an era in which aesthetics is less trusted than ethics. So let me take some time to throw a little bit of cold water on our new enthusiasm for ethics. My point is not to condemn all ethics as a dubious exercise, but to call into question certain ways in which ethics is blind to structural inequalities. Nirmal Puwa's idea of bodies out of place needs to be kept in mind as we think through abstract ideas about virtue, goodness, and being humane. I'm worried that too often ethics has been a mask worn by power and a defensive reaction that holds off change. And I'm concerned that ethics is too often used as a justification for managers, administrators and leaders to retain rather than question their authority over others. I want to unpack the role of ethics in domination, oppression and exploitation. In doing so, I'm following, following up on the moral dimension of the work of Sylvia Winter and Denise Ferreira da Silva, who show the normative anti-black core of modernity. In Winter's words, the shift in the terms by which the expropriation of new world lands and the subsequent reduction of the indigenous peoples to being a landless, rightless, neo-surf workforce, together with the accelerated mass slave trade out of Africa to the Americas and the Caribbean, and the institution of the large scale slave plantation system that that trade made possible, will be made to seem just and legitimate to its peoples. This is why Marx criticized those who campaigned for a fair wage. What could be fairer than a wage set by the marketplace? The problem for him was not to constrain the free market with ethical principles, but to abolish the market and the ethical system that was rooted in it. In thinking about art and ethics and the ethical turn in art, I want to take this example of what is just and legitimate as exemplary. When I say that I have some concerns about art's ethical turn, I'm thinking of the proximity of ethics and horror, to horror, of ethics to genocide, of ethics to white supremacy, of ethics to power. For reasons that will become clearer, I hope I'm modeling this, at least in part, on Rosie Bredotti's association of the human with power and oppression. Ethics is often considered by philosophers as a set of norms and debates quite detached from reality. But I want to think about ethics primarily as it is lived and used while embedded in real social circumstances. Andrew Collier, the critical realist philosopher said, the medieval ethic of chivalry, the Puritan ethic of thrift and industriousness, or the nationalist ethic of self-sacrifice for the fatherland, lose all their plausibility and attractiveness if understood to be conditions for the exploitation of peasants and workers by lords and bosses and the sacrifice of youth on the altar of the arms profiteers. Or as Milton Fisk argued, morality can be nothing else but the obligation of an individual to a group of which he or she is a member and to fellow members of that group. Sarah Ahmed's reflections on the use of diversity discourse in institutions extends this same point. Collier summarizes as follows, the virtues of justice, generosity, and hospitality will be very different in a society produced only enough for subsistence, a society with a limited surplus, and a society of abundance. And also we can add, these virtues will be different depending on the place one occupies in a divided, unequal, split society. Compare the history of street photographer of street photography to the current concern about photographing strangers. There was an absence of ethical concern around street photography when cameras were relatively rare and therefore the photographer was assumed to be a middle class trained person. But now that everyone has a camera phone, the assumption about the person who photographs strangers does not have the character to do so ethically. Maybe the social attitude towards people with mobile phones is present in the ethics of participation participatory art 
in which the artist is proposed as a manager of these others. This material history of ethical discourse is not how most ethical theory is written. Philosophers write ethics as a normative theory of normativity. That is to say, they write ethics as it ought to be, not how it is actually used or is deployed within the existing institutions and structures of actual social conditions. A normative theory of ethics tells us how we ought to behave, but a critical theory of ethics shows us how ethical discourses help preserve social injustice and systematic exploitation. Ethics is often described as a commitment to the responsibility towards others. Derrida, Derrida deconstructed this idea by uncovering the hostility within hospitality, for instance, which I love and I've written about before. But I want to disturb a different complacency, that of the ethical claim to care for the other by reorienting ethical reflection around the ethics of others. That is, I want to ask not how to ethically treat the other, but how to learn from our discomfort at other moral codes that appear unethical to us. What do we learn about ethics if it is exemplified not by one of our own virtues, but by virtues that are foreign, outmoded or inhumane? Also, think of how the virtues of philanthropy have always laundered the reputations of the rich and powerful. Greenwashing, too, is an ethical act, but it preserves unethical corporations. Alan Badiou wrote an interesting book on ethics in 1993 that argued, amongst other things, that ethics is nihilist and ethics feeds on evil and the other as threats to who we are. Ethics, he says, oscillates between a conservative desire seeking global recognition for the legitimacy of the order peculiar to our Western position and, on the other hand, a murderous desire. See also Bell Hook's brilliant analysis of the myth of Columbus, how patriotism and the love of democracy effectively shield imperialism, white supremacy and patriarchy, and how whiteness and power are conceived only as civilization. Badiou does not give us the final word in ethics, but I'm interested in his argument here because it refuses to elevate ethical thought above the catastrophic and monstrous actions that result from it, namely what Bell Hooks calls white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. But you says the modern name for necessity is economics. Ethics is non-economic in this narrow sense. It's what we do because it is right, not because it is profitable or efficient or affordable. Ethics is extravagant. We act ethically regardless of the cost. So ethics appears as the normative surplus of the economic. But we need to be cautious because the economic is already normative and ethics is built into it. For Badiou, ethics holds together a public spirit of resignation to economic necessity. Similarly, ethics appears elsewhere as the normative surplus of politics, of what was lacking, for instance, in the all too easy slide of communism from emancipatory movement to authoritarian rule. The error here, in my view, is to think of ethics as necessarily, that is by its own nature, protecting the interests of the subjugated. Maybe it should, but the social history of ethics tells us a different story. Ethics, historically speaking, has tended to represent the interests and values of the dominant. Empire painted itself as ethical and the colonized as savage and uncivilized. Likewise, patriarchy construed men as universal ethical subjects and women as hysterical and irrational. And always, those who fought against the system have been seen as lacking ethics, whereas those who have killed and tortured to, de to defend the establishment have been regarded as virtuous and principled. The injustice of ethics, understood as the indefensible legitimacy of the universal human, runs through Zakia Iman Jackson's important book, Becoming Human, Matter and Meaning in an Anti-Black World. David Lloyd has, has pointed out that the turn to the aesthetic in Kant was a means of forestalling the immediacy of revolution and installing an implicitly pedagogical and developmental system of representation that defines the human and the political subjects alike as universal and disinterested. While acknowledging Kant's separation of ethical judgment and aesthetic judgment, Lloyd knots together these ethics and aesthetics when he says, the discourse on the aesthetic that emerged in the late Enlightenment, especially in the work of Kant and Schiller, 
consciously assumed a founding role in the reconfiguration of the liberal arts or the humanities as disciplines. These were to be concerned not only with the refinement of taste, but with the formation or cultivation of human beings as civil subjects. Lloyd adds, subalterns tend almost always to appear as violence, regardless of their actual practices, and therefore represents a crisis in the intellectual self-regard, a breakdown of the universal representative subject that is essential for both ethics and aesthetics. This is what E.P. Thompson was tracking when he wrote the chapter on Satan's strongholds in his book, The Making of the English Working Class. However, the literature on the aesthetic has only rarely raised questions about violence in its conception of the human. More typically, aesthetic philosophy has defended the aesthetic as an exemplary site for the development of the human at its best. One of the consequences of the idea that the aesthetic is an exemplary type of activity is that any art based on this idea withdraws itself from direct normative claims because norms are seen as already embedded in the aesthetic object. Norms in modernism were supposed to be secondary or built into whatever was considered integral to a practice. That is to say, norms were imminent in forms. Today, sometimes for good reason, that come out of anti-capitalist, anti-racist and anti-patriarchal movements, normativity is in the driving seat in art. In other words, forms follow norms. As an artist working collaboratively in participatory projects within the social turn as part of the Free Art Collective, I spent most of my time unpacking the romance of community, conviviality and so on. We tried time and time again to develop projects that prevented us as artists from managing publics because we saw so much of this in our field and thought that managing others is an expression of the privilege of being an artist rather than challenging that privilege. The revolutionary tradition has been dismissive of ethics because the problem with capitalism, like slavery, was not put right with ethics. Asking for a fair wage, for instance, is no better than asking for fairness from a slave owner. Communists rejected an ethical version of exploitation and dehumanization in favor of abolishing all systems of exploitation and dehumanization. Ethics appears to be a discourse on how to be a master and how to be a subordinate to mastery, not how to bring mastery to an end. Ethical theories of freedom are written from the perspective of the free, not from the perspective of those struggling to become free. And when those who desire freedom are lectured by the free, to act according to the ethics of those already free, the struggle is ruled out as unethical. How am I doing for time? Uh, if you could wrap up in about two minutes, that would be wonderful. Okay. Yeah. There is a strong correlation between the racial regime of the aesthetic and the condemnation of the mechanical in aesthetic labor that marginalized the work of women and the proletariat. What's more, there is a common pattern of the aesthetic and the exclusion of a variety of embodied humans from the character required for ethical humanity. At every step in the history of subverting, in the history of subverting arts replication of dominant values and structural inequalities, the call for ethics over politics has been the cry of the conservative defending the character of the cultivator. Feminist, Marxist and post-colonial art history, for instance, have all at various times been rejected by mainstream art historians who claim that these critical discourse constitutes an assault on the good character of art historians and that they are not sexist, not elitist and not racist, just experts in their field. Ethical artists and curators are preferable to unethical ones, but ethics in art and aesthetics has no historical record of tackling the problem of art elitism or the white supremacy of arts institutions or arts patriarchal logic. Is art's ethical turn finally the repurposing of ethics to decolonize art or is it once more the defensive gesture of the cultivated to have the character to put their house in order without the need for interference from the others knocking on their door? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, 
there is a comment already in the chat um, that is what you have presented to us is a way to think about means of production um, using Marxist term um, in a way that makes clear the power dimensions um, of the structures, infrastructures, superstructures of um, how art in itself is produced. Um, that slide with um, the placard, which states what political art must do, um, engaging with the struggles of today, political struggles of today, but also um, to always seek to transform the social relations in art. I think um, you're, you've given us a lot of food for thought. Thank you. And um, as we move towards perhaps thinking about a different world altogether and possibly remaking it, taking into account all the violences of what it means to found, to start, to constitute, to institute anything, um, we are turning to Irit Rogoff and uh, her talk on the not yet. So Irit is a writer, teacher, curator, and organizer working at the intersection of contemporary art, critical theory, and emergent political manifestations. She is a professor of visual cultures at Goldsmiths University of London, where she heads the PhD in the Advanced Practice Program. Her practice deals with geography, globalization, and contemporary participatory practices in the expanded field of art. Her current work focuses on new practices of knowledge production and their impacts on modes of research under the title, Becoming Research. Irit, the floor is yours. Um, and please unmute yourself. Sorry, I was mute. Um, so um, thank you to Elham and Live Assembly for the invitation. And it's a pleasure to share the panel with Dave, Maria, and Sissy. And uh, I've actually changed my, my uh, presentation. And um, I'm, I'm going to, to say just a little bit about research as world making. Uh, I'm currently very, very interested in the potential of research as it is uncoupled from the production of applicable results. So I'm thinking about, about research. Um, uh, I'm thinking about, about research not as something leading to something that can be um, useful or applied. I'm, I'm thinking about research really as a way of working and a way of being, um, which is sort of important. Now, over over the past six weeks, I've been teaching um, a course on world making. And uh, as it happens, when you're kind of, of deeply involved in a, in a set of materials, um, I kind of have been running a lot of my thinking through the concept of world making, and this kind of—I'm sure it happens to most of us—that the, there's a sort of, of the emergence of another filter through which to think through, through which to think through your your um, your preoccupations. So the the I'll, what I'm going to try and do is just kind of of maybe three points around this conjunction of um, emergent modes of research and forms of world making and what these have to offer us. So this this is what I'm going to sort of try and do. So the first thing to say is what is now being called the research term. Um, which is a, a, a kind of, of great proliferation of research among practices. So not research that is in the background, not leading towards something, but research as the main event of the practice, which then requires a whole set of, of, of kind of, of questions about how to make research manifest what are the right formats and, and platforms? And what does it mean to be the audience, the viewer, the receiver of research? And this is something that it would be wonderful from my perspective to come back to 
uh, in our conversation because this is, you know, the thing I think we've thought about least. We've thought about research. We've thought about how to make research manifest, but I don't think we've given a great deal of thought of what it means to be the recipient of research, right? The the sort of 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 way in which um, one is faced with vast amounts of information or data or data visualization, um, or or with however it's delivered to to its audience, and that one has absolutely no way of processing or kind of, of engaging from one's own perspective. So this, this is something that I'd be really happy to come back to. Um, the, so one thing is this enormous proliferation that we, we are, are um, we're seeing. The second is within this, emergent form of research, one of the things that we're seeing is a move away from research based in inherited knowledges to working from conditions. So we're, we're, we're seeing um, a, a sort of, of turn away from, not a turn away from the inherited knowledges because obviously, you know, we need them and we use them, etc but a turn away from positioning oneself at the tail end of a kind of teleologically organized body of knowledge that um, to, for which one, in which, sorry, in which one finds a kind of location for oneself and one's work at the end. So we're offering something slightly new on a, you know, kind of great chain of knowledge that we've inherited, we've studied, we've become familiar with. And, and so on. So I'm I'm very interested in the turn away from inherited knowledges as forms of research to the notion of working from conditions. Now, it's really important to say that working from conditions is not working about conditions. So this isn't about subject matter. This is very much about producing a, a methodology producing a, a way of thinking that is structured through the conditions that one is living out. And, um, and, and this, is, this is a kind of, of, at least for me, it's a long chain of thought which started with thinking about the difference between critique and criticality and thinking about the fact that criticality is having analytical and knowledge while at the same time living out a set of conditions. So the fact that you can't ever step out of the conditions and simply view them analytically, that one is always a kind of, of, of entangled subject within the very conditions that one is, is kind of speaking of. And this, this is you know, work that, that sort of, of came about through reading Hannah Arendt and sort of, of, of thinking about the, the sort of, of uh, thinking about her, her notion of space of appearance really, and, um, and what it means to become a political subject. So the, the, that's kind of, for me, the research term. And um, the, the, second, the second part of, of, of this kind of, of inquiry, is the impact of research from the creative and practice sector on more traditional notions of archive, data-based, and experiment-driven research. So I, I think on the one hand, what we've seen is a great proliferation within creative practices of practitioners kind of turning to research and making that the, the kind of heart of what they're putting forward. On the other hand, and this was very unexpected for me at least when I started thinking about it, was the degree to which this move within sort of creative practices has impacted on far more traditional archival based or data based uh, or experiment driven research. And again, you know, the, this is, I think, a continuation from Thomas Kuhn's thought on paradigm shifts within the sciences. Um, it, it, it has its kind of points of, of beginning 
kind of elsewhere. But the, the recognizing that across sociology, anthropology, the law, the kind of, of, of various humanities and social sciences, things that in the, have been developed in the arts, forms of fictioning, folk, forms of docudramatizing, forms of, of um, mimicking institutional kind of frameworks um, that were very much part of the arena of practice have now entered the arena of scholarly research. And that, that kind of really interests me, the fact that, um, because, and the reason it interests me is it because it's a validation of these as methodology, right? It's not, it's not just borrowing and mimicking and, and sort of dressing up in, in somebody else's feathers, but it's very much about how, how, does, how does the shifting notion of method and methodology kind of, of, of get legitimated? And this is what I was seeing um, in, these, in these kind of shifts. So I wanted to link that to the work, uh, to the work that all of my teaching on world making um, really pivots around, which is Jean-Luc Nancy's notion of world making. And I'm going to do my best to share my screen. Um, Is that working? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So the the um, this is just three slides and trying to to sort of make slightly clearer what is often a very kind of dense philosophical argument. So kind of taking the cue for this thesis from the distinction put forward by the philosopher Jean Luc Nancy between globalization a world system based on flows and circulation with their own logic of profit and efficiency. So that's a term that we're very familiar with and a condition that we live out, or at least the underlying condition for a lot of political kind of decision-making and policy-making. And the distinction between that and the notion of world-making so world making is a set of relations between people, places, conditions, heritages, and hopes need, driven by the need to both envisage and inhabit. And it's this notion of envisaging and inhabiting that makes me want to draw together research as it's taking place within the sort of creative practices and the notion of world making. So this is a distinction we need in order to counter the authority of neoliberal economics emphasis on profit at the expense of conditions, environments, rights, and stabilities. So shifting away from the emphasis on profit to the emphasis on conditions, environments, rights, and stabilities. Um, this is a body of work that um, Nancy articulated um, in a book called The Creation of the World or Globalization, um, which has quite, I, I, I have to confess, has quite a hold on me uh, because of the kind of possibilities that it opens up. So it is the contrast in meaning between globalization and world making that Nancy endeavors to reveal in order to open up the possibility of a world. So for him, it's not a pre-existing entity for us to inhabit, but the, the daily need to continually open the possibility of a world. From the beginning, he emphasizes that the global or globality is a phenomenon that is more abstract than the worldly or world forming. He refers to globality as a totality grasped as a whole. 
and an indistinct totality. So that's globality. While the world, the worldly, world forming, calls to mind rather a process in expansion in reference to the world of humans, of culture, and of nations in a differentiated set. And then the final bit from, that I wanted to um, that I wanted to bring from Nancy um, is in the final analysis. What interests Nancy is in, in this distinction between world forming and globalization is that world forming maintains a crucial reference to the world's horizon. And that again, like world making has become a really important concept for me uh, in terms of uh, the actualization of the self, the social and political actualization of the self. As a space of human relations, as a space of meaning held in common, a space of significations or of possible significance. So world forming produces the potential of a world horizon that in turn is that which kind of, of creates a location for human relation, for spaces of meaning that is held in common between humans. Um, and a space of, of significations or significance. On the other hand, globalization is a process that indicates enclosure in the undifferentiated sphere of a unitotality. This is one of those very, very dense non uh sentences that is perfectly accessible and transparent for a mastery without remainder. So the, the, the sphere of a unitotality is that which can be subject to mastery. It's that which can be taken over. Therefore, it's not insignificant that the term remains untranslatable while globalization tends to the integral translatability of all meanings and all phenomenon. And here he's referring to the fact that writing in French, uh, the term for world making for him is mondialization. And that mondialization is not a word that exists in the English language and not in other major Western languages. And therefore he's had to kind of come up with the notion of world making. Okay. So, um, so this this is kind of of, of the, the the thinking that anchors my kind of understanding of the potential research, uh, sorry, the potential link between research as a way of working from conditions rather than positioning ourselves within, let's say, a named and recognized body of knowledge. The notion of research having the potential to produce a horizon that in relation to which we can place ourselves. Now, what I want to maybe try and say with this, although I, I have to confess, I, I'm not far enough with the thinking on, at this point and uh, so I'm saying this a little bit tentatively, is that the potential for a research base to engage the political, the political differently. And the, the, I, I think that we have this in common, all of us, that we really want to find ways of engaging the political differently. And my kind of, of, of way um, is sort of, 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 of thinking about research. Now, how to, to engage the political differently is not necessarily reshaping the subject of politics. And so within that kind of trajectory of world making, I've been thinking of, of a lot of things that are really more shifts in the way in which 
we might locate ourselves than shifts in the recognizability of the the subject of politics as we kind of bring it up so i'm i'm thinking about you know work like that of Ashim Mbembez which in which he says very overtly he says is the edge of the world i.e africa the space from which he's locating his work is the edge of the world a place from which to rethink the world right or or the 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 sort of of um work of of um Negri and Hart and of Giorgio Agamben around the relation of, of the, the emergent politics of multitude, where they're saying is if if the the both the subject of politics and the subjects of politics are dispersed in this kind of lateral way, is that a, a, a sort of potential for um kind of 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 world of world making of producing producing a, a, a different access into to um into the political or the 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 way in which an entangled environment which cannot differentiate between human subjects and mineral subjects and climactic subjects and botanical subjects and zoological subjects is a way of entering the political differently right so the and these are for me examples of world making of not the uni totality of the world but that kind of of fragmentation and dispersal and and need to position oneself differently so the potential for a research base to engage the political differently not responding to crisis or writing wrongs, as Spivak calls it, but rather the exploration of new entry points into the political, points that are askew and oblique, that look away from the headlines to see other, more man minute manifestations. And the the sort of, of the base of, of this research that I'm thinking about within creative practices rather than within the kind of grand pantheon of inherited knowledges is has as its foundation as the place from which we work kind of of instability precarity transitioning fleeing and migrating so and all of these are essentially i think different ways of thinking instability right and these are different words that i'm using for instability and what what does research that uses that as its entry point as its kind of foundation rather than st the stability of of kind of axiomatic knowledge that has been has been agreed on what what is the potential of that to engage the political differently and finally the the researchers world making allows for the entry of unexpected actors into the arena so individuals encountering the world in hardship or community organizers thinking about about research not as a privileged activity so not one that takes place when you've set all your ducks in a row and you kind of know where you are and what you're doing but research emerging out of hardship so not a privileged position at all but one that where we recognize the kind of, of conditions and operating from conditions as hugely important sources for knowledge production. So I'm 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 sort of, of thinking about research not as a privileged activity, but in essence as a mode of survival. And um, now this 
I think, and this is again something that I would like to um, maybe come back to if there's a chance in the discussion, is that for me, one of the consequences of thinking this way has been kind of, of, of flipping the notion of participation on its head in a way. Because participation that is enacted along the lines of certain kinds of protocols um, that are laid out by whatever the context in which the participation takes place. So, you know, in, in democratic political processes, this is um, elections and in unionized labor forces, these are protests and in cultural spheres, this is modes of paying attention. So that kind of participation is absolutely articulated by the, the, the sort of institutions and protocols that organize their fields. And I'm sort of thinking of participation that is driven by conditions, therefore has no legitimate framework to operate in and um, needs to kind of redefine the very notion of participation. But that's that's something maybe that we can unpack a little bit um, in, in our discussion. So this is really what I wanted to put on the table, this notion of research as world making and where I, I because, you know, it's easy enough to say research in, in practice and in the contemporary sort of, of, of world that we're operating in is the main event. It's not something that happens in the background. This is it. It's the main event. But then you have to justify that. And for me, the, the sort of, of the process of trying to justify it is to think it as a process of world making. So that's the, what, why I'm putting this forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Edith, um, also for very generously and widely different with you. Um, part of what I'm hearing is that we need to um, be very sensitive and alive to the tentativeness of the world making, that there is not just one way or a right way, and in fact, thinking in those directions in order to institute a world that comes with a particular order is perhaps not what our conditions call for right now, or in fact, ever, given the violences that Dave um, presented um, in a very um, expansive way, um, conceptually as well as materially. So thank you both, um, Irit and Dave. And now we move to Maria Klavayova. Um, who will be speaking about how to be together otherwise, and um, also capturing um, some of um, Jean van Heesweyk's talk yesterday on trainings of the not yet, um, which is of course based in Bach in Utrecht, um, at which Maria has been uh, a founding general and artistic director um, since 2000, the year 2000. So Maria is an organizer, researcher, educator, and curator. Between 2008 and 2016, she was research and artistic director of the collaborative research exhibition and education project Former West, which culminated in the publication Former West, Art and the Contemporary after 1989. Maria has instigated and co-organized numerous projects at Bach and beyond, including propositions for fascist Propositions for non-fascist living, future vocabularies, New World Academy, among many other international research, education, exhibition, and publication projects. Over to you, Maria. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Eloma, for your invitation. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Cici, and the entire organization of the Live Assembly for making this project possible. Thank you, Dave and Irit. There's um, so much um, uh, that I look forward to, to discussing 
and I really greatly uh, look forward to it. Uh, and thank you uh, in this lineup of thank yous also to everyone who joined um, online. Now, as we gather in this unfolding three-day uh, ongoing conversation about to, to really quote from the curatorial statement, how small art organizations can better serve local communities and help shape the future of life, life as in International Performance Art Biennial, I'd like to take this opportunity to speak from within the practice of Bach, Basis for Actuelle Kunst, uh, uh, based in the city of Utrecht in the Netherlands, and how the very same question has shaped our practice, and practice actually at the intersection of art, knowledge production, uh, and social action, or if you will, um, um, processes of thinking how things are, and envisaging, uh, envisaging how they could be otherwise, and indeed inhabiting or living these imaginaries as, it, uh, as uh, if it were possible. Now, already to be sure uh, to know that others are struggles with the same question or similar question about how one can serve better uh, uh, the communities uh, offers already a sort of encouragement uh, to me, a comfort of sorts that in fact there is already a community. Um, if dispersed across the globe that cares to do things differently in and with art institutions, and which understands that this long, often difficult and discomforting, yet hugely important trajectory still ahead of us is an inevitable trajectory towards and of repair. Now, I'd like to speak to two recent and ongoing projects at BAC, so uh, uh, very concretely, namely Fragments of Repair, and trainings for the Naughty Ed, as already mentioned by Sissi, with uh, artists Kader Atia and Jonathan Heisweg, respect, uh, Heisweg respectively, uh, as I would like to ponder the notion of relational ethics as constitutive to the processes of instituting otherwise at Bach. Now, I quite deliberately want to look at artistic practices and the, these two concrete collaborations with uh, artists, um, because they were less the conventional operations of the art institution, um, but rather an operation on the institution by these, uh, by these artists. And I think uh, this is quite a uh, quite interesting moment for an institution or uh, the moment when, when you see the, the, the institutional frame wiggle, to use a term by, uh, uh, by Mick Wilson. And ex actually something that I would like to talk about as a sort of actualizing or inhabiting uh, the practice of institutional um, decentering. Now, if you allow me, I'm going to share my screen and I will be reading from my notes mainly for the sake of the time management. So let's see how and whether this works. I will hope. Yes that you can, wonderful, thank you so very much. So let me begin with uh, Fragments of Repair, which was a multi-part project convened by Bach uh, with artist Kade Atia and Decolonial Forum La Colonie in, in Paris. This project that closed down just recently, although it's continues by, uh, it continues by other means, actually consisted of three parts, and I just want to uh, mention this really quickly, of an exhibition called Fragments of Repair, Kade Atia at Bach, then Fragments of Repair, La Colonie Nomade, which was essentially a collective study program uh, 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 convened by the colonial feminist thinker and activist Françoise Verger in uh, Paris, hosted by La, Dima, uh, La Dynamo uh, de Banlieue Blues in uh, Pantin in Paris, uh, after unfortunately uh, uh, La Colonie uh, had to close down during the summer uh, 2020 due to the pandemic uh, situation. And the third part, Fragments of Repair, which were hybrid online offline gatherings, which I will refer to uh, later. Now, taking place a year and a half into the COVID-19 pandemic, the project Fragments of Repair emerged into a world in a more visible state of brokenness. An avid multiplier of not just itself, but every injustice it encounters, the virus and its effects continued to reveal deep-seated wounds and injuries across the globe, in need of repair. Now brought into full view, it became obvious that these wounds and injuries issue from the nexuses of historical colonialisms and present-day authoritarianisms, economic disparities and growing racial violence, 
and the continuous abuses inflicted upon already vulnerable, precarious lives and increasingly frequent climate disasters. Now, this underlying um, historical, social, political and economic conditions amplified under the pandemic emergency by social isolation, sustained stress, chronic uncertainty, existential insecurity, emotional despair, exhaustion, loss and fear have expanded the viral contagion into this quiet and global psychological pandemonium. Now, driven by this pandemonium and the urgency of the wounded psyche and the injured collective mental health, the project, Fragments of Repair, put forth the notion of decolonial repair, conceptualized by artist Kader Atia as both a tool and a tactic of engagement with the current conjuncture. Now, to be sure, um, Injury, wound, and repair have been key concepts uh, across Kader's practice, particularly in relation to the material and immaterial injustices of colonial violence that persist into the present. Repair, according to Kader, um, is a form of culture resistance by means of reappropriation, in his own words. Kader often cites the Japanese art of ceramics mending kintsugi, or the practices in pre-colonial African societies, while the former, the Kintsugi, showed broken ceramic pottery fragments resealed in radiant gold to actually highlight, highlight both their breakage and repair. The latter engage in a boundless chain of reparation, up and reparation, up and reparation, acknowledging the object's journey and making the traces of their memory fully evident. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I actually have a full screen. Shall I stop sharing and reshare? Apologies for this. We tested and tried, but we can try again. Hello, everyone. While Maria um, resets her screen um, and rejoins our browser, I hope we are enjoying the silence. So I'm back. Yes, you are. Well, unfortunately, whenever I try to put the, the PowerPoint on, it uh, gets me off. Of the, uh, yeah, unfortunately. Shall I try one more time? Sure, to share screen. Would you mind talking, talking to me with a, um, whether it's possible, whether you see my screen? Unfortunately, I don't see it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very sorry. I cannot uh, share. Um, Brian, I think you have a backup, a backup file from me. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Brian. I apologize, but you're there, so I'm going to try. Brian, could you go another slide? Another slide. 
Thank you. That's very encouraging. Let's try again. Um, this this installation does show uh, does show the understanding or or the notion of decolonial repair at, as as um, uh conceptualized this as essentially a repair that is always necessarily bound to wound and injury in a fundamental permanent way uh, even in the mine and especially in the in the Western uh, societies faring of course under the flag of reason wants to have its psychological and, psych uh, and physical scales removed, uh, scars removed, erased, or hidden at the very least. Now, against such denial, uh, Kader pro proposes to reclaim the scars. And if I can get the next slide, please. Keep these scars continuously inside and acknowledge that in every repair there is something irreparable. This irreparability is both the reservoir for ways of knowing the world, or knowing the world anew, if you will, as well as a source for future-oriented resistance and resilience. Repair, then, is not a return to past ways, but a space for collective imagination as practice, imagination as practice, aimed at carving alternative pathways toward what is yet to be. Now, the exhibition Fragments of Repair was conceived as a multivocal repository of knowledges and practices of decolonial repair. Across nine works, it engaged with questions of the legacy of colonialism, the conundrum around the restitution of colonial objects, the structure, structural violence of present-day racial and extractivist capitalism, and the practices of state-sponsored control and surveillance of the vulnerable and disenfranchised, and the role of modern architecture in them. Now, if the works begin from the robust critique of the past and present ills, they also tirelessly engage with speculative visions of repair in relation to the collective psyche and alternative imaginations, rerouting, uh, as it were, impending hegemonic futures through irreparable repair. They simultaneously model meaningful pathways for life in and out of the current convergence of crises. I'd like to pose by one of these works, namely the installation objects interlacing, if I can have a next slide. Thank you, which is an installation with video on 17 objects, some of them rendered in 3D nylon prints, and some of them being wooden copies of African artifacts. In the video part of this installation, a variety of practitioners engage with a complex subject of restitution of African culture after artifacts violently displaced into Western ownership during the era of historical colonialisms. Pondered from various contemporary perspectives, philosophical, legal, anthropological, psychoanalytic, analytical, and economic, as well as the viewpoint of collecting and museology, the assembly of voices unfolds a great complexity of restitution as a practice of repair that reaches far beyond the simple return of plundered objects to their place of origin. Through their spoken accounts, the protagonists decry the looting colonial machine, as well as its tragic disregard for local cosmology of life, the stolen object signify. Can I have a next slide, please? Within such cosmology, the objects are the living and acting force, and a fundamental symbolic, philosophical, and discursive resource sustaining its people as a society. The West has appropriated them not for these cultural, social, and religious meanings, but for their material and market worth, having thus emptied them of spiritual charge, soul, and secrets. Yet having been held away from their natural function and native habitat, over time the artifacts themselves have internalized their new roles, absorbing in particular their characterization as aesthetic and ethnographic objects. Now accumulating these manifold hybrid identities, they underwent fundamental mutation, and so did the populations they used to belong to. When you talk about the return of objects, one protagonist asks, where are they going to return to? And then do they return as their goods, or is the immaterial they once held reclaimable? Or is it irreparable? Can this irreparable repair, is the term again, can this irreparable repair become a source of creative reinvention for all involved in spite of persisting colonial asymmetries. And if the objects belong to both places, 
can they mediate new relationality, a new world in relation? And I would like to add, can they perhaps mediate a new institutional constellation to sustain both care and repair so needed for the world in this state of brokenness? Now, in search of a tentative answer to this last question, let me now take you, if only symbolically, to one of the gatherings. And if I can have a next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, which was a conversation between Suleiman Bachir Diagne, a philosopher based in New York and Dakar, and Wayne Modest, material culture curator and researcher based in Amsterdam and Rotterdam. Uh, and this session, this gathering, this conversation was connected to the objects interlacing. Next slide, please. I want to recall a brief yet powerful moment in this exciting gathering, and I really recommend to watch the entire uh, conversation online. It's beyond electrifying. At some point, Suleiman de Yagne Bachir says or, or ponders around the notion of colonial objects as restless objects that grow roots in all places, including in the ethnographic and art museums in the West. A crucial act of returning them to their legi legitimate creators, however, will not stop that restlessness. And this prompts Suleiman toward an intriguing imagination that I find to be drafting contours of a future institution, indeed across distance. Next slide, please. I had this imagination of a kind of a world museum, says he. Next. A world museum with its units dispersed, and scattered, next please, around the world. And he continues, Selvin Saar and Benedict Savoy were aiming at this with the subtitle to their study, next slide please, restitution of African culture heritage towards a new relational ethics. This idea that the return of the objects in terms of going back to their legitimate owners and those who created them, slide please, is but a step toward forging this new ethical relationship, this new ethical relationality, and making sure that the objects are now in continuous flux, that in their restlessness, they are going to travel around and be the basis for dialogue, for transmission, for collaboration, and essentially for new dispersed institutions around the world, for perhaps, I would like to add, being together otherwise. Next slide, please. Let me from here move briefly to um, uh, trainings for the not yet, convened together with the Dutch artist Jennifer van Heesweig around this notion of being together otherwise. And I know some uh, of you had an opportunity to speak with Jana during the program yesterday uh, when she talked about the notion uh, of becoming collective. Now, um, as the time does not allow me to go much into the details of, of the project, um, I would like to specifically bring into our conversation three key considerations. Next slide, please. Firstly, a powerful proposition that expounds ways we could understand how the art object could mediate the relation to and with the communities or publics, rather. Namely, through understanding is not merely as an artwork, as we got to know it under um, the regimes of Western modernity, but as what Jeanne van Heijsley calls a learning object. Next, please. Clearly, this proposition reorders the protocols that place meaning exclusively or predominantly onto the object of art and suggests a shift toward an actualization or an living or inhabiting of a different dynamic, a dynamic within which objects are constituted as meaningful toward the space of relation in other words. Next slide, please. The learning objects, to be sure, presupposes a particular notion of pedagogy. And this is the second consideration that I wanted to touch upon, namely the practice of prefigurative or anticipatory learning, a form of pedagogy embodied in coming together in order to learn what does not yet exist. In this, Jennifer Heisweg proposes uh, learning objects as prompts to learn, not about the objects and not even so much from them, but with or nearby these learning objects, which are themselves already repositories of community knowledges, 
much like this slide on balancing, balancing interdependencies actually show us. Next slide, please. This is, in short, how Jennifer Heisweg envisions the notion of the training as a rehearsal of life, if you will, in a modality of being together. Otherwise, next slide, please. All the while training in radical decolonial listening, dreamscaping, next slide, please. Creating sanctuary and enacting radical care, fighting in the struggle for housing and building economies of solidarity and composing intersectional alliances to becoming truly collective. To name but one example, which itself embodies the search for, for what trainings really are and what makes out of an exhibition a training or learning ground, next slide please, is a learning object titled Study Manifesto 5.0 from 2018, written collaboratively, collaboratively by artist Joy Mariano Smith and Ron Saleh, a passionate call to discover and plunge into the joy of learning and of embodied knowledge. Now, in, her, in their five-day-long training around the study manifesto titled Mad About, Mad About Study, Joy Mariama Smith carrying out collective reading and writing, conversations, somatics, movement research, karaoke, and more culminate, culminating in a dance party, inquiring, what does it really mean to be mad about study? And moreover, about studying collectively, specifically in relation to community, to the public art making and social practice. What would studying be if it were a joyful public expression of collaborative learning? Joy Mariama Smith set up a training that began to answer these questions by, me, uh, by, by means of doing. Inspired by black, fugitive feminist and gender studies and departing from, of course, the undercommons of Stefano Harney and, and Fred Moulton, the training sought an understanding of study as unrestricted sociality one that dissolves the overwhelming centrality of formal education and formal discursive closures on which it relies. One that escapes fixed structures, policies and identities and engage, engages formally unrecognized knowledges and desires. As the artist put it, we will create our own definitions of study and learn collectively. We will look at white supremacist culture and how it disrupts modes of learning. We'll also question productivity as it relates to action and ways of learning. We will do nothing. Our aim is to create a space during our time together with a multidimensional, social dynamic, fun and complex investigation toward the not yet. Next slide, please. But lastly, what kind of futurity is the not yet that the project training for the not yet proposes? What does it mean to train for it, to practice it, to live it? and to live it as if, as if that were possible. Clearly, the not yet is a temporal category or also a temporal category, but it is not simply a future of projection, not simply the future based on the unsustainable myth of energy expansion and growth, and simply appearing in a linear fashion from past and present, the misconception which we know has produced an immense class of the defutured across the planet with no access to a livable time. Next slide, please. And yet the title of this panel, Models of Possible Actions Covering This Distance, suggests for our discussion more a spatial category, if I may to say so, of the distance. In this context, I'd like to con conclude with a brief anecdote. In preparation for trainings for the not yet, Jennifer Heisbach has reached out to hundreds, maybe thousands of individuals collectives and what we offhandedly refer to as communities across varied multiple geographies, varied multiple times, varied multiple practices, movements and disciplines, referring to them cons uh, con uh, consistently as a local community. Puzzled, I inquired about her notion of the local and learned it has little to do with confined neighborhoods or a shared postal code. Rather, she regards, the she regards the local as a condition and a constellation. In other words, an arrangement that affects a particular way of living and being and replicates across topologies of all sorts, across multiple geographies, across multiple times, practices, movements, and disciplines, etc., etc. 
Often she refers to it as an ideological and emotional infrastructure that upholds communities in struggles across the planet. This, in my imagination, undermines the dichotomy of the local versus global that has by large guided the working of the contemporary art field of the last three or so decades and ask us perhaps to think proximity and distance differently. I'm excited to think this through the notion of an art institution distributed across different locals, dispersed into or as multiple sites of resources, bit of knowledge, time, budgets, of course, spaces, etc., and thus situated both within and nearby the struggles for social, economic, culture, and ecological justice. And I leave it here with thanks to Brian for wonderful collaborations. Thank you very much, Maria. And thank you for all the work that has been put into a building this platform for the kind of conversations and the research that is live, that is happening amongst the speakers with attendees. And we are going to return to a conversation about audience, about participation, about how research is performative. So performative research as a way of thinking about creative research and in the Canadian context, a research creation as an emerging category that hopefully could um, escape the kind of uh, capture uh, that we are wary about. And Yasmin put a, a very um, resonant comment um, in the chat a little while ago. So we'll return in around 15 minutes um, after we are um, perhaps given a chance to localize some of the ideas um, and through our bodies, um, think with and through our senses. So with that, um, Brian, please whiz us away to Verbfrau TV to join Margaret and her guests. Are we on the air? It's all of us, Margaret. We're all here. You're all here. OK. Uh, I said they would rush in and we'll start. So we were just having the most intense and fabulous talk, but we will start now. Okay, so uh, first of all, I still haven't figured out how to flip this thing. And so if you have a mirror, you could try doing this maybe. So no, this it's, is it's straight. straight. Can you say it? Is it straight? Yeah. Mirrored for oh. you, not for us. Oh, oh, you, oh, well, great. So. Greetings, my name is Margaret, AKA Verbfrau, and I want to introduce you to my two pals, dance artists whom I love to work with. Nicole Rosebrand, please, Rosebond, Nicole Rosebond, and Kate Franklin, great. I love to work with these two. They're also fantastic teachers. And what we love to do more than anything else is just to get together and roll around on the floor and kind of breathe and do very little, which we'll get to soon. But first, let's talk safety. Uh, there's a PARQ form at the bottom left corner of the screen. And Canada Health suggests that you look at these seven questions at least once a year to see if your health has changed and if you should be in touch with a practitioner before you start exercising. And when you want to get out of that form, it's at the top right, there's an X. Please sit on a chair that doesn't move or roll, not an office chair, a kitchen chair is good, unless you're in a wheelchair, put your brakes on, or a four-wheel walker, put your brakes on. Um, And please have a cell phone or a plug-in phone if you have one of those. Because in Canada, if we have a medical emergency, we call, what do we call, what number do we call you guys? 911. 911, right on. We call 911. And in another country, if you were in another country, you probably have another number. So make sure you know that number. I'm turning on my timer and I'm going to ask Brian to put on the music, and we are going to start doing. So let's hurry up and relax. You can also sit on a sofa, like Kate. And if you need for some reason to have some support, get either a towel or a cushion to put behind your back. Thank you. 
wherever you are, take a big breath and let it out. Take another big breath and let it out. Let's just mobilize a couple of the areas of the body that we kind of torture through being on the computer so often. So let's roll the shoulders back. You might hear some snap, crackle, pop, Rice Krispies. That's okay. As long as there's no pain. And let's go the opposite direction. And take the arms to the side. And we'll do a half sitting in the chair sun salutation by lifting the arms up and bringing the arms to center. Let's do that again. Inhale, big stretch to the side. If you can, begin lifting that belly into the back of the waist if it's not there already. One more of these. Ah, oh, yes. We're going to open the legs. And we're going to do a supported small forward fold. I'm taking one elbow to my thigh and the other one to the other one, bringing my hands together like I'm sitting on the hockey bench, you know, waiting to go back onto the rink. And if it's comfortable for you, let the head hang a bit. It's quite heavy. And keep the abs engaged. And you could just stay here, particularly if you have conditions like osteoporosis or a doctor or physiotherapist has told you you've had bulging or herniated discs, or even just undiagnosed high blood pressure. Just stay here. Or acid reflux. But if you like, I'm going to get my two pals to roll down farther to the floor and let their head hang. So now we're going to let them really stretch the spine out. Great. So some of us are up here. Choice one, I'm going to turn sideways so you can see me. I'm not going very far. But I'm getting a decompression and creating some space in between my vertebra and my ribs, particularly my back ribs. Then I'm breathing. Now we don't want to stay there too long. You probably haven't eaten for a while. So wherever you are, lift the belly button in, bring the chin to the chest and unroll slowly one vertebra at a time until we come all the way up to sitting. Great. One thing for the hands which also, and wrists, which also take kind of a bit of a beating at the computer, we're going to take one hand forward and flip it over. Take the other hand and press the fingers down just to what's comfortable for you. And this thumb joint here usually needs some movement and support from all that keypad action, texting action. Nice slow circles one way and then the other. And turn the hand over and stretch it out, that is splay it, and then make a fist. And take it both directions, maybe faster and faster until it feels a bit like a blur, and then shake it out. Circle through the wrist one way and then the other, and guess what, we'll do the other side. Big breath in, big breath out, and stretch those four fingers down, circle through the thumb, and the other way. Are you breathing? It's easy to hold your breath when you are doing something new. Stretch the hands out to a splay, and then a fist. And in and out and in and out, that's great you guys. It's faster and 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 circle through the wrist and the other way. Shake them both out. And now we are going to move, as promised, to the floor, our favorite place. So Kate, I'm going to ask you to use the sofa to support your lower legs 
and make your way down to your back. So your supine, if you want something under your head, I know you've got lots of equipment, a pillow or a high density foam cushion or nothing. Not everybody needs something under the head. And uh, Nicole, yes, that's perfect. I would like you to use your chair. For those of you who are in a four-wheel walker or a wheelchair, I'm going to stay sitting with you. And if you were forward in your chair, four-wheel walker not so supportive, you might need a cushion. You could also do this on your bed, lying down on your bed or the full sofa with both your knees bent, if that felt good. But I'm going to stay up here with those who are sitting. Take a big breath in and a big breath out. Soften the lips and the tongue. And allow the weight of the body to melt into the ground, particularly the back body. Allow the back of the neck to melt into the ground or to the back of your chair and the area in between your two shoulder blades. Think of this melting like warm chocolate. And releasing into the ground. Soften through the waist and through the whole pelvis. Think of the pelvis maybe as a bowl and it's warming in the sunlight and melting into the chair or the floor. If your legs are raised, allow those beautiful long muscles in the front and back of the thigh to release and lengthen and soften. Soften through the back of the knee. Soften through the shins and the calves. Soften through the back of the heels and through the soles of the foot, left and right. At all 10 toes. Enjoy the weight of the body on the floor. We're in a safe place, we can't fall. We're on the floor or in a safe chair. So we can even let the weight of our eyes melt into our two eye sockets. And release down into the earth. Inhale and exhale. Releasing into gravity, the very loving arms of gravity. And as I like to say, gravity always wins. Now you are quite welcome to stay right where you are and breathe. But I'm going to ask Ryan to turn the music down and I'm going to ask each of my pals for a very quick answer to a question. What, what do you teach in your teaching practice? Kind of, what are some adjectives or nouns or verbs you can give us? Kate, can you go first? There she is on the floor, her favorite spot. <laughs> I think I'm 
I think in my teaching practice, I'm mostly trying to. Uh, this might be a, not the answer you're looking for. I don't know, Margaret, but I'm, I'm mostly looking to um, awaken curiosity. That's it. Awesome. That's a awesome answer. What about you, Nicole? Um, as my mentor and dear friend, the late Trish Beatty would say, I teach to empower people. Oh. This is my is medium, a, that's what I teach. Empower these people. are two pithy answers that are wrapping up a long discussion we had while you guys were in the main room, which uh, was great. <laughs> says thank you so much for sharing your body and your being and everything with us you guys and thank you everybody from assembly and all of the folks particularly you brian what a trooper you are and everybody it's time for frugal friday flyer last one have a wonderful rest of the assemblage <laughs>
in very many different realms. Uh, climate justice, a given COP26 in Glasgow, racial justice, which has been uh, revived in many ways and reactivated since the murder of George Floyd back in May 2020, but also the different kinds of ways in which current arrangements, mm -hmm. political, social, economic, actually put some of us at more risk than others. So um, from perhaps starting with um, Maria's a call for a different ethical um, rebalancing, if you will, um, through um, repair, the concept of repair and uh, the cases um, and exhibitions um, to the way in which Irit has given us some prompts and propositions for conditions of a new ethic. Um, so in terms of protocols, perhaps um, through creative research. And then today's uh, warning that the ethical could also be very totalizing, um, that closes rather than opens our horizons. Perhaps all three of our speakers would like to speak about um, how, how we can imagine, if we wish to, um, a different archeology span of the future. So switching around perhaps uh, the temporal linearity of how we tend to think about especially building knowledge. As you wish, and remember to unmute yourself when you speak. Hmm. Okay, I'm, I can... I can't answer your question, Sissy. It's beyond me. But um, I maybe maybe I, I need to unpack these into components in order to be able to think of of them. And so I I have no answer as such. But I think sort of as, as I'm writing this book called Becoming Research, which is you know part of of what I tried to put forward today is part of that process. I realize that it's really all kind of militating against the notion of frontality, that it's frontality that I'm embattled with and have been for a very long time. And frontality has to do with all kinds of assumptions that you know what the problem is, you can recognize it, you know how to categorize it. You have the capacity to kind of galvanize various critical perspectives in relation to it. So I, I don't think anybody assumes that they can solve the problems, but I think it's the positioning vis-a-vis -vis the problems with some notion of certainty that I call frontality. You know, the ability to see it all, the ability to recognize it, the ability to name it, the ability to galvanize critical tools in relation to it. And I think that for me, the issue is how the hell to get away from frontality, because it's, you know, it's the one place I do not want to be. And the, the sort of, oh, so in kind of dealing with, with, you know, how do we mobilize ourselves in relation to the kind of issues of the day, I, I begin with a kind of a willful refusal to say these are the issues of the day. The, the sort of, of rather spending time trying to kind of, of kind, kind of trying to undo, unpick them in order to to kind of, of show that they are more than anything a veiling of the issues of today, right? Mm -hmm. A place for the issues to actually hide from from plain sight. So the the so for me that's that's kind of in the process of work. That's always the first step, and a kind of important one. Because I was thinking about what Margaret said towards the end of her kind of, of exercise and thinking if, if, if I had to think of a word, 
you know, of what characterizes my practice, it would be transformation, but without the clarity of from what to what, the process. Wow. And um, so that's, you know, a little bit of a partial kind of, of response to what you were asking. So being open to creating together and through multiple perspectives, um, creating better problems, um, I think. I, I think, you know, all, all of us who, who kind of try and understand the political tenor of the world that we're living in know that neoliberalism, which is the political world we're living in, has a phenomenal capacity to veil um, and, and um, dissemble and use um, a kind of benign, humanistic, you know, vocabulary um, for for its ends. And so, I, I guess the the sort of of seeing through the problems to the problems is an issue. But then positioning oneself as um, you know not as not in charge of a whole set of subjects equally important and i i think transformation is just a recognition of the kind of intensification internal intensification that we have access to but somehow kind of of avoid because that's not supposed to be how we work right we're supposed to work differently but i i do think that transformation is access to a kind of internal intensity and intellectual intensity and imaginative intensity a drive that these are the agents of transformation mm -hmm. Okay, it's a very poor attempt, but this is kind of what I have to contribute to this study. Thank you, Claire. And um, Maria, please. Can I weigh into this? Um, I'm fascinating, I'm fascinated uh, it by what I read actually in, in your contribution that everybody researches. Mm -hmm. um, Yet I feel that, or fear perhaps even, not everybody, it can... We can't hear you. Really not? I, uh, can you hear me now? I am, I'm not muted. I can't. We can hear you, Maria. I think there might be something on uh, Edith's end that uh, Brian might be able to help us troubleshoot. Yeah, I wanted to ask a question to Irit and maybe also to Dave. Please. At the same time, but I fear Irit cannot hear me. Yeah. Maybe um, we can reiterate it, reiterate it later. Mm -hmm. But so if everybody researches, which is really something I genuinely believe in, I'm afraid that not everybody is in a position of privilege to be able to drag say, things sideways, in other words, to afford not to confront issues matters frontally. Mm -hmm. And and thus, I wonder whether connecting today, if you uh, your your uh, uh, suggestion and proposition of um, using artistic privilege tactically, is there a way to use artistic privilege tactically to create open points? To, to dress things. Yes. Okay, I can't hear you. I, something is wrong with my... I, I, I don't know why, but I can't hear. Dave, I, I see that you've got an ear kind of sign above your image. I wonder where that comes from. That's because I was muted. Yeah. Okay. Um, while we troubleshoot, 
Uh, Judy, it's, um, okay, okay. Um, yes, so, uh, thank you. Sorry, Maria, I'm really sorry, but I didn't hear a word. No, I'm, I'm very sorry. I, maybe it's good you didn't. Maybe I could kind of collect my thoughts. But it's a complex <laughs> platform, you know, like uh, I was trying to share my screen and each time it would just throw me, throw me out. But here we are. No, okay. So what I was trying to say that I'm fascinated by the proposition that everybody researches, and I truly believe believe that. I fear not everybody is in a position of privilege to be able to drag things sideways in order to avoid frontality, as you suggested. So I think there's a little bit of a discrepancy there. And uh, and uh, having listened to to wonderful proposition of using artistic privilege tactically by Dave, I wonder there is a whether there is a way to use privileges, whether scholars' privilege or artistic privilege, tactically here, in order to 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 try to find or open or create openings for those who cannot directly uh, afford avoiding frontality to be able to do that. Yeah, I, I understand. I think yeah, it's 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 um it's a really valid concern, and I don't, it's not one that I would want to dispel. But I think one of the things that's kind of interesting is, you know, is a recognition of others' capacity for research, and then the way in which kind of it gets incorporated through collaboration. So I'm thinking, for example, what happened at the last documenta between an organization called Friends of Halit in uh, Kassel, who were a, a kind of, of Kurdish German um, group that were researching the murder of Kurdish German migrants in Germany by either police forces or right wing kind of, of, of militia and who then kind of started a, a series of collaborations with artists and researchers. But really the, the sort of, of, this isn't the only recipe there, it's just something that comes to mind. But uh, I, I think what, what it is, what, what I'm talking about really, is mutual recognition, right? So that I don't think research is simply done by those who have the tools of legitimate research and that I'm able to recognize both the, their capacity for research and what they're coming up with and that we somehow enrich each other in terms of maybe, maybe I have means to put it forward that are useful. Um, and so I, I think what I'm trying to do is um, disperse the kind of, of pathways of knowledge. I want knowledge to come from a lot of different directions and be expressed in a lot of different means. And I want them all to be as, as valid as one another, equally so in the academy. You know, I, I hear so much around me. Yes, yes, very interesting subjective impressions and experiences, but this isn't, you know, transferable knowledge. It is transferable knowledge. The, it, and it doesn't need rescue or help. What it needs is a, a, a set of mutual recognitions that allow things to operate on the same plateau. So I, I think for me, the first step would be mutual recognition. The, and then conversations about how to translate, how to position, how to put forward. Um, the, the, you know, in, in, in my younger self, I heard so much about, you know, the, the sort of, especially in the United States, about the, the sort of, of the importance of, real life experience and the kind of illegitimacy of a distant critical academic perspective. I think those are hopeless binaries. And that the, the sort of, if we're really serious about knowledge, then we mutually recognize and we start the complex processes of translating and articulating that we need. 
And um, so I, I guess that's that's where I'm positioned. Maria, you also had a question for Dave. Is that right? I think there's a question in there for me, mm -hmm. um, which is which is to do with, um, in 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 my in my uh, way of thinking about it, which is um, kind of informed by Judith Butler's uh, uh, book, um, giving an account of oneself, and, and and what Butler does in that book is to is to say that uh, these dialogues that we have, where we um, where we stand in front of um, what, 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 that appear to be abstract discussions are actually based on real encounters with, in, in her case, for that book, with authority. So you are called to give an account of yourself by a figure of authority. But what that, what that book also suggests is that there, are, there, there therefore must be other real conditions for speech. Mm -hmm. um, and those real conditions are not only the conditions under which you are subjugated and made to give an account to authority, but are also potentially the conditions under which you uh, call the authorities to give an account of themselves, for instance, as an alternative to that. And what that means is that if we're going to talk about how ethics is always uh, embedded in real social circumstances, then all counter ethics, if I follow the line of argument properly, will also be embedded in what we might call like subordinate pockets of social reality. In other words, we generate our sense of um, I don't know, worlding, of world making from certain pockets of the world that we live in, not those pockets of the world that constitute globalization, but other real activities that we engage in that allow us to speak differently, that require us to speak differently. And the same for being together otherwise, is we can identify the real social circumstances in which we are together in ways that are not dominant. And, there, and, and therefore, we can say, I think that uh, all utopian norms are extrapolated from real subordinate lived experience, which goes back to another thing that Eric was just talking about. Um, and but it may be in in unexpected ways. So 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 I'm not trying to find a kind of clear way of navigating through this problem. I'm trying to, in a sense, disperse it even more and say that, you know, for some people, you know, famously for Alain Badiou, this is, uh, he navigates this through love. Um, but you can also navigate it through boxing and, and other sports. I'm just picking boxing because it's, <laughs> it kind of seems like the opposite of love in one way, but it's also, in a sense, the basis of a kind of normative world which is alternative to the dominant normative world. So, um, yeah, so, and research, I'm thinking, I mean, especially with this wonderful question of who is the recipient of, of research, then becomes the basis of us thinking of what would be the real conditions that you would want to construct, as Jana was talking about yesterday. What real conditions do you want to construct for an encounter? And so if we're talking about who the recipient of research is, then what we also need to talk about is what kind of spaces we occupy in order for that recipient to be possible. While we're on that, um, I wonder whether we can talk a bit um, about the conditions then. Um, if it is a case uh, that um, research is an activity that could uh, welcome um, equitable participation, if not equal. So I take it at any one point, as one um, tries a question um, and uh, we continue to um, 
allow that question to be dispersed and evolve rather than find an answer or one answer or a singular solution, um, then the recipients of research are the researchers because we are in a fully participatory atmosphere, even if not everybody would be articulating at the same rate, at the same pace, at the same time. So um, in that sense, um, I suppose we're also um, taking away the particular roles that are perhaps prescribed into a formal institutionalized research context, right? Mm -hmm. And then with that, I'm thinking about the granting structures. Um, yes, for academic research and primary research, but also the ways in which cultural institutions are supported financially by grants with a panel um, who judges uh, the legitimacy and the promise of that thing that is to come, the not yet. So um, in many ways, right back um, to the forces uh, that um, constrain yeah. the and, problem. And I, I think uh, there's, there's a big shift that is required here, I think, that participation is something that is plotted out for us through protocols, you know, that, so we are given ways to participate. We view, we listen, we demonstrate, we, we vote, we, you know, cast ballots. Um, I, these days I'm casting ballots every day for strike action, right? So that's sort of depending on, on um, so the, the, the question, the question for me then is the, the, Sorry, I've, I've, I've lost, I had the train of thought and I distracted myself with strikes. Uh, the, the, <laughs> the, it's, it's, it's a kind of shift of how, how to think kind of, of um, how, how it's a, it's a Deleuzean kind of, of, for me, it's a Deleuzean kind of shift because it's a shift from trying to establish what is it? Because when you know what it is, then you know how to position yourself in relation to it. And to ask another question, which is, what does it make possible? So that undermines the capacity for judgment which is really important because I think the capacity for judgment is at the heart of so many of the disasters that we're experiencing. And um, it, it means that you can't automatically figure out a position or a way of, of acting within something. So it's, it's the, the I, I was on a, a a, a jury in Germany for some practice-based research, something or other. And there was a German professor who was also on the jury and he kept saying, well, it's not that and it's not that. It's not art and it's not science. And I thought, yeah, sure, it's not that and it's not that, but what does it make possible? It makes possible something for which you not do not yet have a category. Right. So the, the, uh, now, to be able to perceive what the what possibilities get constituted out of an encounter of any kind, a reading encounter, a performative encounter, a propositional encounter, to perceive what might kind of potentially be possible through that. And then to work out a set of relations to oneself emerging from it, I think is where the work, that's where the work has to be. That's, that's what I think the work has to be. So I, it's been so clear with the pandemic that the most important thing for every form of authority, World Health Organization, governments, you know, the, the has been, tie down exactly what it is, this pandemic. And then variants kept arriving, right? And it kind of destabilized the tying down process of what it is. And then figure out a 
immediate and definitive response to it. In the meantime, this pandemic has changed our lives irrevocably. From quotas of sadness to disrupted workplace to, you know, irrevocably. And you don't get at that with knowing exactly what it is and what to do about it, right? In fact, what you get is the dissembling. It's neoliberal dissembling. Get as far away, you know, as possible from the affective dimension of all of these political crises and talk in terms of solutions and, and so on. So when you are, if you ask me what research is, that's what research is, right? The, the sort of, of, of think about every crisis around you as revealing some possibility of recognition that you might not have had and that you don't know how to respond to and that you can't develop a protocol about. And to acknowledge the presence. Um, so you exactly um, what is required of us um, to work with the conditions, um, maybe. Um, just to kind of um, think about this in terms of keeping a high tension. So um, Edith, as you're um, calling us to preserve or uh, even instigate that intensity within, uh, that is internal, intellectual and imaginative as a starting point. Right. Um, to recognize oneself as a subject that could be other than the subjected. Um, reminds me a little bit of um, Susan Lee Starr and uh, her sociology of infrastructure. So the ways in which patterns um, are already um, standardized always, and this speaks to some of uh, the conversations we have had um, over the past days and also today about how um, it is so simple for the dominant to co-opt um, particular margins in order to include for the sake of, and this is uh, reminiscent of our day one morning discussion um, for um, equity, diversity and inclusion agendas uh, around the world. And sometimes with the J beforehand, just to make it Jedi. Um, something that is sound bitey, something that allows for tokenisms um, and the ways in which it, it is easy to invite. So what are the responsibilities or the responsiveness of hosting institutions? So um, what Maria is doing at Bach, for instance, um, and the way in which um, Paul O'Neill in day one through um, Publix in Helsinki is actually allowing for a facilitation of um, different centers and localities of understandings, of makings, and of beings to come together. Um, and so, yes, that sort of intensification um, that defies standardization that comes externally, I suppose. Yeah, I, I, I just want, want to say, I mean, I know Maria's practice better than I do. I know Dave's practice. So Dave, I'm, I'm not being disrespectful here. It's just my ignorance. But the the I, I think, for example, what I recognize in Buck's institutional practice, what is really important for me in pedagogical practice, is the demand to take take yourself seriously. So I think you know that's one of the things that Buck allows for as an institution, in a, 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 to put forward a demand for whoever is is sort of entering to take themselves seriously. And the and that's my demand from my students that I want them to take themselves seriously. Now, taking oneself seriously means recognizing precisely all those intensities within oneself that might not be actualized, which one might be kind of, of um, cause very often actualizing intensities is extremely uncool, right? So that sort of, of, of um, it, it, becomes, it becomes something to be a little bit wary of. So those institutions, those practices, who in the encounter with others demand that one take oneself seriously, 
um, and come to grips with everything that is really there, all the capacities, all the intensities, all the intuitions, all the rages, all the boredoms, you know, that, that's kind of what I'm talking about. And so it's a, it's a very affective seriousness. Um, and, and I think it's, it's a very important demand. I think I wouldn't be a teacher if it didn't allow me to demand of people that they take themselves seriously. Thank you. There is a, there is a um, proposition, um, a comment, and a set of, through a test a set of observations in the chat. I'll read it out loud. Would it be useful to discuss the historical, material, or intellectual distinctions between research and study? Even if we argue for its convergence, it might be well worth not taking for granted the difference between research and study. I'm thinking of the post-war and post or decolonial institutionalization of the ethical, political, even aesthetic fields, which were studied in struggle, which arrives to us in institutions today as black study, indigenous studies, migration studies, women and gender studies, etc. And uh, this attendee brings up the idea of study because it is so grounded in struggle. Maybe this connects to the discussion yesterday on Marxist thought and art practice. Mm -hmm. Yes. Comments from the panel? I'd be, um, I I'm very interested in this. Uh, I don't know whether I can respond to every aspect of it, but um, Certainly, the what it, what it um, what it touches on is is in a sense a, a kind of um, the of thinking of the material circumstances for thinking and being differently. So so uh, so if we think about study and research. As, as, as it, in a sense, occupying different places and of maybe being um, executed by different people, people uh, who, are, who are divided in, in some kind of structural way. Then uh, Eric's question earlier about De drawing from Deleuze, what does, it, what does it make possible, then can be brought back together with uh, De Silva's uh, concern in the metaphysics of, of race, which is what are the conditions of the possibility of racial knowledge? So, so that to me leads to a, a kind of slightly comic uh, question, which is what are the conditions of possibility for making other things possible? Um, and, and I guess in the, in the academy, in, in the university and in the in the museum, we can overstate things like thinking, and we can overstate things like doing. Um, and 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 yet, I don't think that it's uh, it's wrong to talk about those things, and I don't think it's wrong to talk about the need for institutions of change. Um, because there, there will be no change without thinking and doing and institutions of change. Um, but I remember, so this is, this is now kind of taking me to an anecdote, okay? I remember being uh, an, an artist invited to, to an institution that wanted, at some point during the, during the meeting, the institution said that they wanted to have stronger relations with local schools. And, and my response to that was, well, put the kids on the board. And I said, no, we, that's not the kind of relationship we want with them. What we want is for them to engage with us. And I said, well, it sounds like you're not engaging with them. So if you don't take them seriously, how do you expect them to take you seriously? You've got to have institutional infrastructural relations with these schools or else what you're doing is just growing your audience. And that doesn't strike me as being very interesting. So um, 
so so this this is this is why um alan sears argument for infrastructures of dissent is so important is that we have to build the conditions for social change not merely i don't know um advocate it and then expect it to happen kind of you know spontaneously or something just because we've had the good idea that we should change doesn't mean that we're going to make the change without building those infrastructures of change um maybe maybe one response to this i think it's a very important question to to ask about the distinction between research and study and i think and i can't map it out entirely but i can say that i think study in this kind of contemporary vein in which we're thinking about it, study and fugitive study, which are not exactly the same thing, um, is born in struggle. And it has a certain kind of, of a, it's, it's a collective enterprise. I think very often research is born of a condition and revolves largely around trying to figure out an entry point for oneself. And so the, the finding out that research is about is a finding out about how to position yourself and find an entry point in relation to a condition that you are inhabiting. And so I, it's not that the one is individual and the other is collective, because I think a lot of research is done in conversation it's dialogical, um, but I think that the, there's the, there may be different levels of organization and different different levels of recognition of being involved in a struggle. So maybe research is preliminary to study. Um, the the sort of maybe study is a um, consequence of of research. I, I guess that's that's kind of directions that I'm thinking it in. But it is it you're right to insist on a on a distinction. I think the the distinction is important. I I've always loved the idea of fugitive study of of Moton and Harney's notion of fugitive study because it's about um, it's about finding kind of sly, unexpected pathways within existing structures. So it's not exiting the structures, but kind of finding little veins of, of possibility within the structures and then inhabiting them absolutely fully and eventually that kind of creates some kind of transformation in the institution that the institution never intended and certainly didn't seek out. But it happened nevertheless because there were people there. You know, it's that situationist, that wonderful situationist kind of, of motto that's saying that, you know, the situationist international was about the passage of a few people through a moment in time that that was it, right? Not, not what it brought about, not what the results were and so on. And, and I think that fugitive study is precisely that. It's the passage of a few people through a moment in time together and with consequences that cannot be categorized by the institution and then, you know, taken sort of, of used as credit for itself. Can I add to this, um, like the conversation moved uh, somewhere else, but indeed research, study, training, anticipatory learning, these are the discussions we have at VAC. What is it that we, we're really doing? And parallel to it, and I think it also connects to Dave, what Dave maybe offhandedly on in between lines touch upon. Do we talk about community? Do we talk about publics, making things public and making publics? Um, we don't talk about audiences, but what is the relationship between these notions of community that we so offendedly use and the notion of struggle? 
Are we actually connecting to struggles? Are we connecting to communities? And these are really extremely vivid discussions, and they are part of very important process undergoing at BAC. As the Jeanne State related, Jeanne van Heesweg uh, State um, related uh, to the organization with people involved in the trainings for the Not Yet, who in the meantime became accomplices of the organization with the goal to liquefy the borders of the, of the institution, to perhaps make holes through which um, um, you know, the governance of the organization changes. Um, and um, uh, building towards something that uh, uh, that they, the accomplices, together with Jennifer Heisweig and others, refer to as community portal. What happens if art institutions becomes a community portal, really intimately connected to a variety of struggles, and indeed providing an environment that um, uh, that allows one to come together in this collective study, collective learning. Uh, collective imagining, uh, if you will. And I, I find this extraordinary important, important process. And I think institutions in the sphere of art have enormous possibility there, here to, to create a space where this sort of research, this sort of study, this sort of anticipatory learning can really take place, perhaps not against, but in spite of all the protocols of research that exist, uh, that exist around us. At the university mm -hmm. here, there has been discussion over the past uh, 21 months or so, alongside fugitive study and the necessity of it, um, also fugitive planning or fugitive organizing. Right. Uh, the ways in which, yes, those of us um, in roles that are imbued with, yes, power and authority, but also duties and responsibility to remain responsive to those um, who need, who are made to struggle the most. Right. So the concept of the fugitive comes from uh, those who have not already been heard or recognized within uh, the structure, be it infrastructural, um, or systemic. And uh, the ways in which these um, various strands of thinking and also experimentation, um, what is fugitive is necessarily um, uh, materialized through enacting. Um, otherwise, there, there is no fleeing at all, um, insofar as thinking is something that is perhaps always already first internal. But then the invitation to think with, to be together, um, and then the otherwise, and always maintaining space and time. And I would argue through considering very carefully and seriously conditions of care and, re and repair in the way that Maria and um, Abak um, has been um, instantiating um, is necessary for us to continue the conversation at all. And it is a struggle in itself um, to continue um, to be in this space of uh, what Chris Creighton Kelly in day one called um, generative discomfort. And I very much hope, especially through the three morning um, sessions of live assembly in 2021, that those of us gathered, those of us um, who are um, entrusted um, with uh, decision making uh, at the live biennial would really take to heart and take seriously those offerings and those gifts that these conversations generate, um, such that we can continue to struggle together, to study together, to creatively research together. Thank you very much, Edith, Dave, Maria. It's been such a pleasure and a privilege to share this space and time with you. And everybody, Thank you for your comments, your questions, and your engagement. Um, what will follow in about half an hour is the final installment of Annotating the Archives um, as uh, convened by Yasmin Kweli Kalaora, this time in conversation with Dana Warren and Peter Warren. Thank you very much, everybody. And and to make sure to take time to continue to take a look and to work with each other. Have a good rest of your day.
and good evening. Thank you, Sissy, for pulling it all, all together. Okay. Bye for now. Take care. Bye.